So welcome everyone to LifeSpot.com, where we prove ancient medical wisdom with modern science. And today's podcast is a really special podcast. I want to introduce to you a dear friend of mine, someone I've known for more than 20 years or so, uh, someone who's doing the most incredible work with endangered herbs and helping us to revive our ability to use herbs and take them off the endangered list. We have created a project, uh, a whole new line of herbs that support these endangered herbs that are grown in a safe, holistic way called RARE, Reviving Ayurveda's Rare Ecology. And I want to introduce you to the man who made that possible. And today I want to talk about endangered herbs, how these endangered herbs can be revived, how important they are, the mission behind it, and what we're doing here at LifeSpa to help that uh, this whole project becomes something real. There's thousands upon thousands of herbs from around the world, but in India, thousands of them that are endangered, that are just not available. When I went to India in 1996, and, uh, oh, sorry, 86, uh, for just a three-week vacation, ended up staying there for a year and a half, one of my first fascinations, what I want to talk to Prashanti about, was kaya kalpa. The, the herbs that would restore longevity, something that I've been fascinated from the very beginning about and I'm still fascinated today about is the whole idea of Vedic longevity. What they knew about longevity is so much more important than what we know. And I've talked a lot about the lymphatic system and how the study of rasa, the lymph, is the study of rasayana, which means the study of longevity. And I was fascinated by that. But when I went to India and I found that the herbs that they use for these longevity practices were gone. They were missing. This is 1986, before the, the yoga Ayurveda wave took place and, and scavenged all the herbs out of India and wildcrafted them into sometimes extinction. They were already gone. So, so now, fast forward 30, 40 years, we're looking at uh, way more herbs, so many herbs that are endangered, and someone had to go to the Himalayan mountains and work with the local growers and revive the ability to make that happen. And this is not easy work. This is work in the Himalayas, 40 miles from the, 40 miles from the border of Tibet. To get in there with his hands and, and shovel and pick and axe and really make this mission happen. So this is what we're gonna talk about today and how you guys can get involved in supporting this amazing you know, mission that we are on here at LifeSpa in conjunction with his foundation called Dunagiri. So let me introduce uh, uh, Prashanti Dejager, who again, a dear, dear friend of mine, incredibly brilliant man, so well-versed in so many different things. At 14 years old, read the World Book of the Encyclopedia three times. So that sort of tells you who this person was. Grew up in Michigan, spent 10 years studying, getting degrees at the University of Michigan. Um, he went to India in 1990, spent uh, eight years there, nonstop learning, studying, uh, developing his, his ethnobotany skills, his herbalist skills there, uh, was the original, one of the original founders of Organic India. He was the one who, who procured all the herbs to make that company happen. Um, he is now the, uh, the director of the School of Vedic Mandala, which is teaching uh, Ayurveda as one aspect of all the Vedic sciences, which is just incredible, which is how it should really happen. And of course, the, the co-founder, of a, of a, of a uh, foundation called Dunagiri, which is mission, whose mission is specifically to help revive these endangered herbs, which we're going to talk a lot about today. And I think Prashanti and I first uh, fell in love with each other years ago over a lot of things, but one of our, our common interests was archery and Vedic archery uh, under the science of Donner Vade. And I've talked a lot about Donner Vade, where we pull back the bow and how critically it's important to hold the bow perfectly, sorry, so still, and how if you move the arrow here, and you create a massive distortional effect on where the arrow lands. So the Vedic prescription for all Vedic sciences was four words, establish being, become perfectly still in your own consciousness, and then perform action from that place. And Vedic archery, or Donner Ved, the science of transformation, which is what we're all about here, deep transformation to make us conscious to wake us up it can only happen if we pull back the bow establish that deep internal silence with things like meditation yoga breathing but you must then take action from that and i don't know anyone who carries the ball 
of Don Irvine in his life, his personal life, and his practice, and, and just who he is in terms of carrying that silence, that eye of the storm, that ability to the bigger the calm, the more powerful the winds kind of person than Prashanti. He's a dear friend. I'm so glad to have him here today. And we're going to dive into some really amazing stuff that, that you've never heard before. So welcome, Prashanti. Thank you, John, so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I tell you, like being up in the mountains doing this work, you know, like, it's so remote and, and it does, it seems like it's endless. And to have you on this side, um, you know, like, you know, sustainability isn't sustainable unless it's market driven sustainability. So if there's not that last little leg, it's all for naught. You know, we could be growing herbs, but um, without the connection through you and then to the, the consumer, to the people who can benefit from these, it's all for naught. And so you are so key, so you can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Because without you, it's like, um, you know, you're just driving along and, and there's like a, a chasm there. And you are that bridge. Well, you know, it's an honor here at LifeSpot. We're so, we're so grateful to finally, I am so grateful to finally work with you mm -hmm. and have a reason to work with you. And I think that's part of the reason we're doing this is because these herbs need to be saved. They need to be cultivated in a way that is sustainable. Because what happened was when these, when, when the money of these herbs that were really, really rare, they were wildcrafted, and their wildcrafters would go in and they would just find them, gather them, and many of the herbs became extinct because no one was cultivating them. So Prashanti found some growers, sort of, in you know 40 miles from the from the border of Tibet, way high up in the Himalayas mountains, and found in really remote, very extreme conditions, mm -hmm. and found an area where Kukti this one particular herb, which is the number one Ayurvedic herb for uh, for liver support, lymph support, immunity, so many things we'll talk about. And he found where this herb could actually grow. And and created this whole, his first herb, which is this old kakuti, which is an herb that supports the liver in such a powerful way. But I'm curious to know, how is it that you found this place? Mm -hmm. And why is this place so special? And talk to me about what the wildcrafting has done to enhance the, the, the list of endangered herbs and what you guys are doing to solve that problem. Right. How we found it, um, actually I was doing this work in the context of Organic India 2001, 2002, and, and it, but it wasn't so um, profitable, you could say. So that was kind of cut out. And, and so I just started doing it on my own anyway. And then one of my dearest friends, Vajra Ashara, he also was up there in the mountains and he was smitten. He was like walking, he'd walk like 2,000 kilometers up in the mountains, just working with the herb barefoot. This is how strong he is. And then, um, and then we joined forces and we were looking all over. We tried so many different uh, techniques or ways to get these herbs grown. Like, find a person with a field in the right place and then give them money, but that would never work. And we had been trying this. Because the money would just disappear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then, um, and we were just bleeding out. And so we kind of had like one last ditch effort to, and, and I, we found this, this, um, these folks who, like in 1999, three men had retired from the army. Right. When they, they're the mountain, when they returned to the mountain, they just still wanted to do their kind of like the um, army vigilant kind of on it. And so they um, started working with the university up there, Srinagar University, and with um, uh, like a NGO, a nonprofit up there, uh, run by Harpal, Harpal Nagy. And so the, the university and these army folks and Harpal Nagy got together and they just started to grow some of these herbs. And, and they, they'd done it maybe for like six, seven years, and it was just petering out. They, because of this very thing, they were growing their herbs, and there was the, um, the, the market was just, what the local market in Delhi would give them was just like horrible. And it was just like disheartening. So then, on one night, I'll never forget it, it was like possibly the last trip up there, after trying to get it to, to happening for like 10 years, take this one last trip up there and because I'd heard about these folks and, and then it, that's what clicked. And one of the reasons why it clicked 
is they, they had the discipline, but also they were 27 kilometers from any other village. And that's, that is like, normally these villages, they're kind of like um, beads on a string. Yeah. There's, just, there's some path, some road, but this, they were just out there. So what that did, um, one of the reasons why all the other, why we bled out is so many villages were just lazy because the government would just like give them money and they just wasn't good for their spirit actually. Like, like treating them like a charity is yeah. so not the thing to do. But this, um, uh, this village was so far out there, it had been independent, totally independent for like probably 2,000 years. Oh, wow. And those people were just solid and strong and honest and, and just so trustworthy. Such a pleasure. Um, yeah, like Arjuna, the, the, the mayor, of, you know, it's kind of, kind of um, stretches the definition of mayor, but such an incredible person. You know, Arjuna, the warrior, right? Right. He's so, he's like that. And he's so strong and calm. Yeah, and so that's, that's how we found them. And, um, and it, absolutely key to have um, Harpal Nagy and his nephew um, Siddharth on this because they, they are, um, yeah, they, they interact and connect us in so many ways, even like just translating. Because the, the people up in the, um, the heights, they don't even speak Hindi, it's Garwali. Okay, even harder to, to communicate. Yeah, and, and this, this man, Harpal Negi, unbelievable activist. Like when, when like these flash floods came, I don't know if you heard about that yeah. a while back, yeah. 45,000 people died like that. Harpal Negi is a guy who just like within like two weeks or so, he had like 40,000 temporary homes built. He just got all these wilders together. Got so who is he in, 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 you know, in conjunction with this project? He, he, has, um, he has such incredible names, such huge respect. He has done so, um, uh, so much. And so, for instance, to get, to get CITES permit, there's like five different government agencies that have to talk, but they don't talk. Right. And and nobody, it's interesting, nobody knows how to get a CITES permit except the person who walks that path. And a CITES permit is? CITES, CITES is the um, international convention or, or um, institution in, in Switzerland that controls all the endangered birds, whether that's a, a tusk of an elephant or a, a paw of a bear or a coral, you know, off Australia or something. And so nothing, nothing can um, touch anything endangered unless it has CITES permission. Right, and if it is so, without that, it's illegal. It's way, it's way illegal. Illegal, yeah. yeah. And that's what's been happening. Yeah. I think Kukti, the herb that we're actually bringing now to the, you know, was endangered in 1997, I think it was. Yeah. And so ever since then, you may have seen it on the marketplace, which means it's been illegal. Right, yeah, yeah. And we stopped using it in 1997. It was the number one liver herb that I used for years and years and years, and then it was gone. Like a lot of herbs have been, you know, just taken away just because they're endangered or whatever. And uh, this whole mission is to help bring them back in a sustainable way. So the brokers, these these guys from Delhi, they come down, they come into these little farms, and they know they can take advantage of these these growers. And what do they do? It's it is just it's just, it's cruel. It's um it's so underhanded. They will come up there and they will know how hard you know, because these herbs. You, know, you plant Tulsi in the plains, you plant it right before the monsoon, three months later you have a four foot bush and you have Tulsi, four months, and it's just in the monsoon, it just yeah, happens. It. But they, these are like two to three to four year herbs, and they take so much, um, yeah, and, and so much can happen, like pigs can come through and just uh, destroy the whole thing, or uh, any, so many different things can happen. So when that finally comes um, when the, they finally harvest it, and it's a difficult plant to harvest and process, then they have that. Then these, these um, it's worth a lot of money. And, but then these brokers from Delhi, this place called Karibali, this market, it's one of these world famous like cutthroat markets. Uh, they come up there and they know that this farmer is marginalized and that is so poor. Right. And, and it's like, you know, like when people, um, they have something that's really precious, but they sell it for like a dollar because right. they just their kids need to eat. That's that's how they're exploited. So these these buyers come up there, 
and then they'll they'll say we'll give you a hundred rupees for that like two thousand rupee herb like two thousand rupees a kg, and then the farmer will do it, and it's horrible because if he doesn't, the, the neighbor next door will, and then and it's just it's just dumb. And then what's even worse, and that neighbor will come over and offer ninety rupees. You know, it's just it's a horrible thing. But instead, I love this because um, yeah, I just. Just protecting the whole situation is such a joy. So what we do is um, we we co-opt it all together. Each village will have like a guild of farmers and or growers, and they call it a guild because the whole idea of a guild is there's an education. Like you you start um, at the at the bottom and you you grow and you come out a master of what you're doing. So um, that's the guilds, and then each guild each each um, uh, village will um, be co-opted with other villages, and then one side of the valley will be co-opted with the, the other. And so we're up to um, co-opting uh, a, a valley together. And so then what happens is that uh, these buyers go up there, and they, you know, and they'll just offer the hundred, and the the guy says two thousand, and with a big smile on his face. And then the the, the guy says, oh, you know, drives his fancy truck to the next guy. I said one hundred. The guy says twenty one hundred. Mm. <laughs> that's great um, so the farmers set a price and the growers set a price and everybody's yeah. on the same page yeah. so nobody gets undercut right. so they all went big right you know our our mission our, the line that we're going to that we're bringing out in the first herb and this is called kuti but the liver herb we talked about but the line is called rare restoring Ayurveda's rare ecology and it's not just about herbs it's about the ecology of the environment the, the Vedic culture the Vedic environment that still exists in these really remote regions where they grow these really exotic rare herbs. So you were talking to me earlier about how the ecology is saved, particularly certain animals, when they're when 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 kukti is grown in this traditional way. So yeah. talk to me about that. Well, you know, in the I've done the same thing in the jungles of central India with triphala. Right. These um uh, basically the um, one of my favorite four-letter words acronyms, NTFP. NTFP is non-timber forest product, and Kutki is kind of this way. But the more NTFPs you pull out of non-timber forest non-timber forest product product yeah, product? yeah. okay. Uh, the more NTFPs you pull out of a forest, the the more value that forest has as a forest. Okay. And so, uh, yes, and and so doing this work in in the, the jungles of, of central um, India. And I've noticed that you could drive a bulldozer through there and like after three months, like where'd the bulldozer go? But up in the Alpine regions- up Because there, it was like what? Was just like- grown, Stolen? Like no, no. Grown over? It, grown over. Okay. It's yeah, like- Just like swallow it up. Right. right. But the, the, up in the Alpine regions, a footstep might last three years. And you don't realize it, but that soil, it's not just soil. There's a surface network that even one footprint breaks that, that like network. tundra, sort of yeah, like that, yeah. well, that you know, right. susceptible, that vulnerable. Right, and this is, um, yeah. So um, things like that are just. Uh, what about the bears? The bears, you know. It's interesting because it's the exact same thing with the the triphala, you know, the 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 great hornbill. There's this incredible bird that's like eight feet wide. It only lives on bibitaki. And so, which is one of the three fruits in triphala. Right. It's three fruits in triphala, yeah. So the same, similar kind of thing, where uh, where the cookie grows and when it needs to be harvested, that that space and time, that time and place, is exactly the time and place where the bears are going to hibernate. And so these 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 wild crafters go, and you know they they have their guns and stuff, and and they're afraid, and so either they'll hurt the birds or the the bears or They'll just disturb them, and the hibernation is broke, and the mom comes out in the springtime like a toothpick, can't feed the, the cubs, cubs die. So just to protect these bears, and there's so many stories like this, to, just to keep people out of those. This is one story of what this, you know, over-harvesting, over-wildcrafting, you know, wildcrafting is not a bad word. You know, wildcrafting is just going into the woods and grabbing your herbs yourself. That's all that means. But when you over wildcraft and you're over wildcrafting endangered herbs, they quickly go into extinction. Right. So not only are they affecting how we can, how people can use the herbs, 
But those herbs are also in areas that are, you know, very, very delicate, affecting the wildlife. And so it's a it's an ecology thing. It's a really big deal to, you know, over harvest, over cultivate, and and you know, this is the Dunagiri's mission. What is what, what would you tell us if what Dunagiri's mission is? To save these um, these herbs from extinction, and also the oral wisdom traditions, because there's, you know, the herbs are great, but if we didn't have the oral wisdom tradition, we wouldn't know that. Right, you know, some of this the the knowledge has has entered the books, and that's you know basically Ayurveda is just a compilation of hundreds and hundreds of oral wisdom traditions. Right, and so they're so <clears throat> precious because these oral wisdom traditions, each valley will have its tradition, um, and um, and then areas will have their traditions, and to to uh, save it from extinction is so key. Because there's there's knowledge that will never come back about these herbs, and you know sometimes people think, oh, Ayurveda is not scientific, right? Because well, you know you look at the litamide tested on like 25 people for nine months, and that was the the duration of the test. That was the sample size. Like these herbs were have been tested for about you know thousands of years on literally millions of people. That's science. Yeah. And, and so much of that information is carried in the oral wisdom traditions. But now the, the kids who the, normally would, would carry that on, their eyes are on Delhi. Their eyes, they just right. want to go down. Exactly. And so it is, uh, and it's dying out like, just yeah. so quickly. So the plan is to, it's a great thing. The plan is, well, there's this one thing where people are very family oriented. So they tend to, if they have an oral wisdom tradition, they'll only t give it to their kids or grandkids. And so the plan is to get the grandkids, computers and video cameras, sit in front of their elders, their grand, and then the elders are just gonna love it because there's their grandkids, and they will just like uh, express it, and the kids will say, wow, this is really special stuff. It's like, and their dignity will return. You know, the, and, and, and the, Instead of the, the elders being marginalized, the elders will be respected. It's, it's a win, 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 win. So many things. You know, my daughter runs a foundation in Africa, and they have the same problem. All the kids, they, and, they, and they, they connect elementary schools in America with elementary schools in Uganda. And, the, you know, and these kids have these great relations. Once they graduate from elementary school or middle school, where do they get a job? They have to go to Kampala, to mm -hmm. the big cities, and they all leave the little villages. And, and this is a situation where if they didn't have you know, this sustainable ability to grow these herbs and have a market to, to make, right. and, have, and that's what the whole point of this whole mission is to give that money back to them so they can grow more herbs, they can get more tools, get fresh water, get mm -hmm. clean houses, and make a, and give the kids something to come back to. Mm -hmm. So they really are, you know, growing a culture, a whole ecology right. around, you know, building up these little villages because these little villages, I've been in those little villages, and they're just tiny, tiny villages, right. and they're just, Amazing that they survive, you know, all sort of independent right. on their own. Right. So they're really fragile, right. and and without having an economy, you know, the, the kids are going to leave, and it, it, in short order, the knowledge will disappear. And that's maybe the most precious thing. The herbs are great; we can take them, and that's great. But the oral tradition, which is thousands of years old, if that goes away, it's gone. Yeah, you know. It's it's a really important mission, you know, that you're doing, and I just feel so grateful to be involved in this and to help. Uh, so we did this year is we we took the whole kuti kuti harvest and we took the whole thing to make sure it got sold, and we took what we needed, and then we're going to create a line of herbs with that called rare uh, under the rare line. And then we gave the rest of that back to um, the foundation, so they can use it and, and sell it wherever they need to sell it. To can, and all the profits, uh, or uh, most of the profits, are going back to the villages and back to the Dunedin mm -hmm. Foundation to right. support this this very important mission to make sure that this happens. Right. Yeah. You know, there's so many people who make decisions left and right just on money, and money is important, absolutely important. But there's so few people who make decisions based on like, really doing the right thing. And I'm so glad that um, you're the, one of those people who say yeah. that. So don't take it for granted. Because I look around me and like these, these Ayurvedic herb companies in India, you'd think that they would be all about saving them. 
but the mentality is exactly the opposite. The more rare and endangered an herb becomes, the more they chase after it and fight each other for it to get the last of it. It's like mind blowing. Like it's total, like you know, killing killing the golden goose kind of thing. They just and yeah. these are, as you say, these are critical herbs in Ayurveda. And Ayurveda is the, the like the oldest, most like well documented herb um, tradition in the world. And yeah, and and so many of those herbs are are key for that. Like the gentleman see. Yeah. So this herb we're we're, we're bringing um, to market, which is this first this harvest that we have, uh, is called kubki, K U T K I. And it's a powerful liver herb, but I want you to describe for us the process of how long it takes to grow, the process of bringing it to market, making you know the the, the labor that goes involved in bringing this this product. <laughs> it tires me just to think about it, but okay. So the government, um, like even the source, if they're going to cultivate this, they can't go to the wild and grab some wild stock and then just put it in the garden. But that's what a lot of people try to do. Doesn't so, grow. No, it does, but then it's still, it's not really, um, it's just like transplant. Right. Is what, and so what has happened is the, the government has, has created so many of these different um, agencies and for different facets of the, the process, they don't talk. And we're the only ones to talk. And this is, you asked about Harpal Nagy. He is just, un, he's so good at that. Getting everybody to talk, or and he was one who helped us get the SAIU certificate yeah, yeah, for this. Yeah, yeah, to make that happen, this guy. Yeah, yeah. and um, and his nephew Siddharth, which is, it's like, you know, you know, up, up there, there's, there's um, there's two types of bears, right? And one type, they both will run the moment they see you. One runs at you, one runs away from you. Oh, there are these good to know. <laughs> there's these boars, and and these males, they they're considered the most dangerous thing. There are so many panthers up there, and give me the panthers. I would I, give me. I would face these. I do face these panthers. But the the horrible like, dully bureaucratic and triplicate kind of world. I would I would die. And so you gotta have panthers and bears then. Any now. day. Okay. Right. That's how horrible it is. And so these guys can can wade through that and, and just like hats off. Okay. It's it's so difficult. Okay. So now we're okay growing. So, well, yeah. no, we haven't got there. Yet. Oh, we haven't got and there. And so one of the so you're talking about just getting what? What are all the seedlings? Be, just to save the what? Seedlings. The seedlings. Yeah, you have to go just to get the seedlings. There's a, a, um, a branch of the government that you have to go to to get this, the um, and you know this, <clears throat> it might be as a as the the eagle flies, uh, maybe like 15 miles, but they have to go all around, and it can take them two days to get there, to go to this government agency and and sign up. And um, but even before that, they have to. Then the government agency has to come and look at their land. How much land you got? Okay, yeah. um, here's it. And and then so finally they. So how many months does it take to go this whole rigmarole? And how six, many seedlings can you get? Six months to just begin growing. Probably begin to get. And how many seedlings? Um, you could you can get thousands. Oh, you can get you can get yeah. once they give you the approval to yeah. get that many. Yeah, but that's it's like. But that's six months of bureaucratic work, red tape. Right. And these people are poor. They don't have time to spend six months going back. And, and like spending money on some bus to get there. And yeah. Yeah. So there, that begins it. And then, but then they have their papers. And those papers say that, um, like, in these years, you can expect to harvest this much cookie from your fields. And so that piece of paper is, is critical. And in fact, that those papers get stolen by some of these, like the um, the the Hindi word for highway robber is decoit. So we call them decoits. These these decoits, they're these um, um, Ayurvedic herb companies in, in India. They they will sometimes steal them. They will send people up into the mountains, steal these people's papers, and then get the wild, the illegal wild, and match the illegal wild with the legal papers, and then walk. Wow, and that's a real thing. No, this is this happens all the time, and my goodness! But now that we're up there, like we, the people who do that, they know us, and they just when we find them, you know, like it's just we just hold them to it. Yeah. So there's that, and then so then they they grow it, and then when it comes time to harvest, the 
forestry department has to come and say, yes, we're watching them harvest it. This is one of the, the things. Um, to be, to work with us, you, um, you cannot harvest on your own. Like one of us, one of the, the members of the Dunagiri Foundation, either Roger Sharat, Tess Rosenbush, Eric Rosenbush, or myself, have to see it. We're on site. 95% of the time, I guess, 100, 100, no, 95% of the time, it's me. Uh -huh. and, and, um, and so without me witnessing it, it's not Dunagiri certified. And, and by witnessing and being there, and, and you know, just I'm pulling, I'm not like obviously a silent observer. I'm, I'm in there. You're I'm in the room. Yeah. So let's take a, a break for a second, because you mentioned Dunagiri certified, which mm -hmm. is similar to fair trade. But why is, what's the difference between Dunagiri certified and fair trade? Then we'll go back to you know, the labor yeah. that goes on in processing these herbs. Yeah. Well, the Dunagiri certified means it's going to be all these things like organic certified. Um, it's going to be uh, like biodynamic. It's meaning that uh, the fields will have um, been empowered um, throughout the years in different natural but important ways. It means that all the, the papers are in order, that everything is truly uh, cultivated, nothing wild. And then a big part of the, the Dune Gear Certified is the processing because there's no possibility, there's no shortage of, of good herbs in India. But the moment humans tend to touch them, there's no sense of quality in that processing. And, and so then it's just a... But also, what is, what is the relationship between fair trade and that? Does, it, does it also mean that they're going to get... Fair trade is... They're going to um, get paid. Yeah. Oh, they, they, the thing is, like for instance, Turkey, the, where it sells... If you went to the, the market in Delhi, this big market, and you sold, or you bought, you went to buy a cookie. You would buy it for one half the price that we give to the farmers, to the growers. Like, just say, if it sells for um, ten dollars in the market, I mean, that's that's in the market to the right. consumer right. Or for ten dollars. We give the farmer twenty. I mean, that's totally backwards, right? Because if it sells in the market for ten, that means the farmer gets one. Right. No, we, we double it. It's a great thing. Wow. And then that's student Gary certification. Yeah. That the, that and, and that we watch it all. We are totally connected. So who's losing money in that process? Yeah, we bleed. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But but you know, it's not about the money. Well, it's not about the money, but it has to be. There has to be money there. Right. And that's the, that's just because the market in Delhi, which is different than the market in the U.S., that's what they're used to, right? That's what they're used to paying. So it has to be right. customary right. for. Right, and the deal but they're is, not used to having people be paid for their labor, right? They're being used right. to getting, getting, paying this stuff a dollar, right. and getting this stuff for dirt cheap, right? Yeah. Right, and then Americans go and think, oh, you can get this stuff for cheap. And there's what I've seen in those markets: you have three piles of herb. You have good, you have bad, and you have great. And there are different prices. And a lot of the big herbal companies will just grab. It's still, you know, whatever it is, cook triple, mm -hmm. cook D, whatever, and they'll just take the cheap one and bottle it up, sell it with cook D label on it. Right. And it doesn't work clinically, which I found in my experience as a practitioner, which is again another important point. Mm -hmm. Always buy your herbs from an herbalist yeah. or a practitioner because a practitioner has to give their herbs to right. a patient yeah. and they have to get better. Otherwise, you don't have a practice. Right. Right? They don't get better, it doesn't work. Right. So, what I learned over the years is you, you have to know where it's coming from and it has to be of high quality, otherwise, it doesn't work. And I think, and that's such a critical piece of the puzzle because a lot of the big companies just grab the cheapest oh, stuff, yeah. oh yeah, and it doesn't work, right? Yeah, you know, or it's loaded with a bunch of right. toxins and things. Right, and I'm sure the the people, um, you know, who get your great herbs, they they've heard of this whole thing of um, heavy metals and Ayurvedic herbs and, and weird things like that. You know, there is a truth to that, and this is why you have to know your source, like to buy from people who are just like. Like, um, like, never do that. To I mean, to for to um, and so much of that actually is based on really poor processing. Yeah. But you know, all these years, twenty-five years on organic India, just and that was uh, just organic India's claim to fame. Just growing it all ourselves, and then just impeccable processing, and right. so you have epic purity and potency, and that's this is um. That's how I was doing it back then. And that's right. how I'm doing it now. And yeah. that's the only way I can do it.
because right. because we're we're practitioners. And we're unfortunately, doctors. that's not the case anymore. Most places. This is it is. Well, the, this is another reason to co-op right. because when you co-op, you decentralize power, you decentralize money. As right. soon as the opposite happens, as soon as the power is centralized and and those decisions are centralized and the money centralized, right. then all then it's the money that makes the decision. Right. And you just it's I've just seen it time and time again. Like I, I'm constantly teaching people how to make their own medicines because I the more I the more herb companies there are, the better. And and so by um, by decentralizing the power, decentralizing the money, it's uh, not only is is it going to stay more honest and clear, but the people will be empowered as individuals. Because so many people might go, oh, I'm American or whatever. I'm going to I'm going to give these people a solution. I know. Like giving people solutions in that situation is a crime. You want to give choice, right? And so the moment you decentralize money and power, you're innately you're giving choice, right? And that that's magic. I get goosebumps just to give yeah. choice. Is to give dignity, right? And and to and just then for them to run with that choice and do, it's such a beautiful thing. Before we get back to the processing of the herbs, tell me, you know, what that choice has done for the growers, for these the villagers, the mm -hmm. little village of Gash, particularly mm -hmm. where this is being grown. Right. What have you seen change in their lives because mm -hmm. of this mission? You know, people don't realize that the, there's this incredible infection um, in India. It's called West is Best, and, and it was, it's been there for 300 years, and the, uh, it's the British put it in there. And these, there's this idea, anything from the West is going to be better. And that, in, in order to control India, the British, like, just assaulted the dignity yeah. of these people. And it's, it, but it's, a, it's like one of the greatest wisdom traditions on the planet. And you, know, you read these websites of so these Delhi like young ladies who have websites on pregnancy and they take this incredible good wisdom and they just scorn it and the, the more they scorn it the cooler they are so right. there's that mentality but to, to bring this choice in and to, to to bring this sense of value to to the land to the tradition to the people it's like it's a beautiful thing it's like to return dignity like if you have your dignity, it's like you have. So you've seen that with, yes. the, with the growers, the dignity. Yeah. Has your lives changed? Have they have they gotten you know better water, or or, the, or what do they still need? Um, there is things are are coming in. That is a tricky question. What do they still need? And because then there's a few different slippery slopes there, but they definitely are like where where all this happens. There's no electricity, for instance. Right. And there's running water, but it's called a glacial river. Yeah. And, and um, so your your concern is that if you go up there and do it for them, then that can actually you know undermine their motivation. Yeah. And that's why the point is they're not getting it. The whole point of this is that we're not giving them money. Right. We're just paying them that a real, yeah. valuable, yeah. honest wage for the work they're doing. Yeah. That and that's what turned around um, doing here. Like Bachir and I were just bleeding out money because we're trying to pay people to do something right and then we finally figured out duh like reward people don't pay anybody pay them reward right reward people for what they've done yeah and reward them well yeah because yeah that, and that's the difference yeah the word gets around so it's not a foundation in the, in the traditional sense where we're just doing charity work no nope. we're creating fair real fair right. trade yeah because fair trade is you know actually isn't so great for the growers always right it's anybody in the business will tell you that the fair trade certification it, it was well meaning, but it was so limited that in many cases um, it was almost hurtful to the point where back in the days, like the, the folks like the Guayaki and we were going to make our own fair trade certification that was really going to be fair. Yeah. But um, there's that phenomena. But this is you know just to to keep the. Um, you know, you mentioned to take care of these these growers uh, as far as the, the organic herbs, but for me, it's to take care of the earth first. Right. To take care of the earth, number one. Like, if you're going to take an organic herb or an organic apple, you're fourth on the list. 
Number one is the earth. You take an organic apple for the earth. Number two, you take an organic apple for the grower, the, the one who takes care of the earth, the farmer, the grower. Number three, you take an organic apple for the person who's going to be processing the, or processing the, um, the pesticides that would otherwise go in. You don't want that. Fourth, you take it for yourself. So this whole thing of take organic foods and it's like it's a little bit um, self-centered and there's a bigger picture to serve. And when you serve that bigger picture, you serve yourself. So interesting, because that's such an important topic, Ayurvedically, right, speaking, because we know that, you know, in India, they would always say, or in Ayurveda, they would always say that, you know, who grew the herbs, who carried them to the, or the food, who carried it to market, how it was cooked, how it was prepared, the whole processing and taking it from the seed to the plant, to the market, to the kitchen, was all very important. And then when the food was eaten, many, of my Ayurvedic teachers when I was there, they could tell if that food was what's called sattvic or not, which means that it was wholesome and loved along the way or sprayed on or, 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 or carried with violence or, or, or poor emotion, things like that. And now we have the science that we do here at Life Spa is we prove the ancient wisdom with modern science. And, and you know, when I first heard that 30 years ago, I was like, okay, that's really nice. You know, you can tell that it's plants or that the food was carried to market really nice and the guy was really happy. I'm going, really? I mean, that, you know, they didn't really compute mm -hmm. how they could actually yeah. happen. But now we have epigenetics and it turns out yeah. that these microbes feel everything. What you think you become, what you see you become. When you sit down and eat food, you're impregnating your emotions onto the microbes of that food. And those microbes carry that into you. And there's a thing now we now call, it's called horizontal transfer of genetic material, which means that you're taking the genes from that anger, which is now impregnated into those microbes, which is real, and it horizontally transfers to your genetic code. And if you get enough of those angry transfer of genetic material, you become angry, you know, or violent, or whatever the case may be. So the idea that how this, these herbs were grown, and the energy and the vibration, which is all carried by the microbes, mm was somehow ooga booga and not really real is now hard science and really the new frontier of science to understand the subtlety. And what we're finding in science today is that the most subtle things are, the more powerful they are. The microbiome, we can't see the microbiome, but it's the most powerful discovery we've ever seen. There's so many things in our, in our world, and Ayurveda was all about living a lifestyle that was so critical to support the bugs, which they knew about too. Krimi, which is the name of the microbes that they discovered or talked about in the Vedic literature 3,500 years ago, were well documented. And they talked about the, the Krimi, the bugs on that were invisible, that were on milk and due to poor hygiene and had strategies to support that. And one of the major strategies that we don't think about was a sattvic, loving, giving, kind, caring lifestyle for everything that you touch, including the earth and the plants and everything on it. And that sattvic lifestyle is now just think, oh, it's a nice, happy, just be loving. It wasn't just a nice, happy, be loving lifestyle. It was a lifestyle to change the microbiology, which we were mostly. And if you didn't live that lifestyle, you become the anger. You become the negative thinking. You become the greedy person. And off goes the species. Right. So that's another reason why this is what you're talking about. The subtlety of this is so profound and it's the new science and it's a hard and it's and it's the science of circadian medicines growing these at the right time in the right place so right. they have the right bugs that were there thousands of years ago that support the circadian rhythms. when you eat wow. those herbs in season you change your bugs you reset your circadian clock which is now nobel prize winning science this is how it all comes together which is which makes what I think what we do here at Lifespot is so exciting and to, and to team up with Prashanti and Dunagiri to, to actually support what so desperately needs to be done versus having herbs being cultivated in big mass, you know, farms that are, you know, high tech farms right. that are just pumping out herbs left and right. This is not going to preserve the integrity of the soil. You just pump in the fertilizers. This is, talk about the magic of the soil where this stuff comes from. Okay. You know, you can be watching some like action movie and some guy he has this little infrared camera and he's running through some dark place and somebody turns the light on, right? And he's blinded. Like, um, it's happened to me up there where the prana fields are so strong that, and the volume of the light is so strong that I, I've only been able to see light. It's like, 
that you're blinded. You can only see life. And when that happens, you, you know that that, 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 that um, terrain that connects everything, that's primary. So you can, whatever word you don't want to use, maybe um, like spirit-centric worldview, that's a primary worldview. Spirit's kind of loaded. And then when you can start seeing again, you see um, life is taking strategies. Like there's a strategy that's creeping across the sky, and there's a strategy running across the field. And, and so these strategies are energetics. So an energy-centric worldview is secondary. And that's like Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine. And this mass-centric worldview is tertiary, actually. But everybody's stuck in a mass-centric worldview. And they can, um, if somebody is seeing things with a mass-centric worldview, but you're seeing it with a spirit-centric, it's, you can never, ever, it's like, like, why wash your hands? Like, right. why, okay, surgeon, why should you wash your tools? Mm -hmm. that, that idea that now we know there's germs? Right. That level, when you see that, then, and then you see, um, and part of that network is the mycorrhizals. The mycorrhizals is um, uh, the micro, the fungi, the rhizals, the roots. You have the mineral world, and then you have the plant world. Well, this this fungi, it's absolutely miraculous. They they have a, a, every plant, every healthy plant that's in a healthy environment terrain will have just the right mycorrhizals. The um, again, uh, myco is mushroom and rhizo is the root. A layer of these mycorrhizals on the root. And it is like this, this magic gateway between the, the, the mineral world and the plant world. And it goes both ways. And so the mycorrhizals will take minerals out of the soil and actually transmute them and, and create the optimal form for that plant. And then that plant feeds the soil. And it's just unbelievable. But that only happens in a really healthy whole Terrain. Right, and in the in that mycorrhizal, those are actually a network of intelligence that connects yeah. all the plants. Right. So if you do something to a plant over here, they're going to feel, right. they're going to protect themselves, put out chemicals to ward off that problem that's coming over here. Yeah. There's a level of intelligence that is based on good soil. You can't just plant a thing in, in your garden and get that. I mean, yeah. I have a garden and do that, but there's nothing like right. pulling stuff out of soil that is you know untouched for. Ever for thousands upon right. thousands of years. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just amazing. Seventy million. Seventy. Yeah, it's a long time. You know, and and I and I and I think about this a lot. Like, where do these herbs come from? And when you go up there, I think what you're talking about is like the the prana, the silence in those mountains. You can cut it with a knife. It's so thick and such a real thing. And I think ancient humans, they lived in that all the time. That's yeah. all there was. Yeah. If you think they could, take away, even here in Boulder, Colorado, you know, a couple of thousand years ago. It was as thick as a knife. It was that still because mm -hmm. that's all there was. And we evolved over millions of years to become one with that silence. That's who we are. And we now have science. I just wrote an article about this, that when you meditate, which I think was a 2,000-year-old a hack to basically get us to reconnect with that silence, which we have millions of years mm -hmm. to be with. They didn't have to meditate 10,000 years ago because... They were in the silence. They right. lived with the rhythms. They understood right. the, the birds and the rhythms, the nature and the rhythms. That was like part of who they were. When you think of Native American cultures and traditional mm -hmm. indigenous cultures, right. they were part of it. Yeah. So now we know that when you meditate, a new study just came out that shows that it can actually change the expression of over 2,000 genes that could express negative traits and right. cause right. disease. Right. So we now have meditation, and like, oh, it's some spiritual thing, and I don't want to meditate. Or same as prayer, which is also a hack, because to give us a glimpse a 20 minute refresher for what our genes are thriving for, which is that stillness and silence. Mm -hmm. And when you take herbs, plants that come from that environment, that's how you're, that's, mm -hmm. we're taking yeah. those bugs yeah. who are loaded with silence up mm -hmm. there, there's no doubt about that, right. and you're putting that inside of you, you're creating a new microbiome. That's why herbs, whole herbs versus extracts, right. extracts are sterile. Right. We use whole herbs at lifespot.com yeah. because we use, we want the organic, integrity of good bugs. They are literally probiotics. We test them for good, bad bugs. We find it with anything, the toxins, heavy metals, we test for all of that. But we make sure that there's really good bugs in them. And when you take those whole herbs, you're actually, you're actually inoculating your gut with the bugs mm. that we desperately need. Right. And that's the problem with the Western microbiome, right. your gut bugs, is we're losing diversity. 
So one of the ways to do that, I feel like I take so many of my herbs because I want those bugs and I want to keep re-inoculating and re-inoculating with diversity because that's what gives us longevity and youth and health. That's going to be our prevention. When you start having less and less bugs, eating only processed foods, I know none of you do that, but it's important to realize the value, the value of eating, uh, you know, eating and consuming herbs. Yes, even from around the world, because we've lost diversity here in America. Even organic foods are grown in you know, industrial farms mm -hmm. and they just don't have the diversity that they should have. You know, another thing about these high altitude plants is you know, we tend to, what we get from the plants is what they tend to be, um, that facet of the plant tends to be supporting the plant with, like the essential oils, the immune system. But we grew up, our species grew up in an environment that was like 20, 25% oxygen. And now Mexico City is like 5%. And so one of the things that we get from these plants, the high altitude plants, is that they're living on, on very little oxygen. So their ability to optimize cell respiration, things like this. Massive. Yeah. And so these high, you take like elecampane, this is this wonderful lung herb that grows um, in Europe, but also in the high Himalayas, okay. you know, the um, Pushkar Mool. And the difference between the high Himalayan one, it's like, it's incredible. For, and, and with, you know, one of the number one um, ways that we're getting sick is the lack of oxygen. Because in general, we're probably down to like 11%. Yeah. And so we need every little, um, any place where we can get assistance on this. And this is a great reason just in that to have these high altitude herbs. This is, um, yeah. <clears throat> One time I was up on a ridge up there, up in the high mountains, and I'm, I'm just looking at this like, incredible landscape, all these snow-covered mountains. And I just feel this breeze coming at me, and I'm almost like leaning into it. And, and it's, then I realize it's not like a fast breeze, it's kind of like a, a slow breeze. And then I realized, well, actually the wind is on my back. And it was like this, this inexorable, like, pranic feel, just yeah that's yeah it's 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 different if you you know here in Colorado we're, we're lucky because we can hike in the 14,000 foot peaks and you get a mm -hmm. taste of what it's like at those high elevations but you're talking elevations of what where the farm is like we, we grow these between like um, like seven and ten thousand okay but then but some of the herbs are even as high as like there's some that are 18 yeah yeah, that's, that's really up there. So getting back to the, the processing, we're, we're running a little short on time. So the processing, you have to harvest them, which is yeah. a, the pain, because these are roots. These are really, really long roots that go deep into the ground. Well, well they, they actually, a lot of them just um, cruise across the surface, okay. and they don't go so deep. But even you think it, you could harvest it, but my goodness, they are t tenacious. They are strong. Yeah. And yeah, there's that. And But one of the things that totally have we pioneered. When we first were up there, we'd take these herbs, then we'd trim the, the herbs, and then we'd wash them in buckets of this glacier water, right? And within within 30 seconds, you're in pain. Because it's so cold. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're trying to scrub. And so what happens, you don't, it takes a long time, and you don't do such a good job. Yeah. And that's, and so what we've done is um, take gas, um, Pressure washers, right? Like motorized. Yeah, like, yeah. And okay. so, and just lay them all out um, in these different levels, and then we we take the this, the, um, this gorgeous, gorgeous spring water, which is so unbelievably powerful. Like people are healed just from the spring water. Yeah. And then we wash it with the pressure washer. We it's about forty times faster and at least like six or seven times cleaner. Yeah. And so we took everything to this whole new level. So yeah. you harvest it. You spray wash them. Mm -hmm. That has to be dried. Dried very carefully. Yeah, yeah. Um, take shade netting and just yeah. Um, takes usually depends on the sun. Here's an interesting thing: the best herbs grow on the north side of the slopes, which have the least amount of sun. Uh -huh. yeah. And so the amount of sun we have in a day to dry these things um, is limited. But yeah, put because it, you're on the north side. On the north side. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and so there's that, and it typically takes anywhere from like four to six days. But here's another thing: there's um, so many cool little woven. It's 
corporations moved in. 1992, Rajiv Gandhi lifted the tax from import tax from like 300 to three. In that moment, I mean, corporations just invaded this like you know, one and a half billion people. You know, imagine that. And so there's all these corporations just throwing products at people, which means throwing packaging at people, and there's practically no waste management. So the corporations are delivering uh, packages, government's not taking them away. And so it's, it's like so sad. But I noticed that, the, that on some of these bags, like the, the potato chip bags, a lot of them have this like a mylar lining. Right, so you reflect the sun. Yeah, so I, I take these bags apart and, sure. and then I, I tape them as solar reflectors and get like two days. I, I, I accelerate drying by two days by right. using repurposing the trash. Who is the potato chips? Or you get it out of the trash? No, you, they're just in the road. Really? No, the, they're thrown all yeah. yeah, there's no waste management. Yeah. And and oh. we're really high, so there's not a lot there. But when I'm further down, I, I will grab like hundreds of, yeah, just to repurpose it. And then also, people say, "What are you doing?" And you know, just to get them interested in. Oh, nice. Yeah. Spread the word. Yes. Yeah. Wow, amazing. So, um, a couple of things about about this project. This is the first, or the Kuki, that we're bringing to market, um, and it's available now. Um, and like I said, the proceeds of this are gonna go back to the foundation and back to the farmers and the growers, which is really important to su support the sustainable growing of these next year and next year and next year. And I think it's just so amazing to have the number one Ayurvedic liver lymph herb. We never really talk I know. I about, just realized that too. about what, what this herb does. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what this herb does. But I, I am so lucky. Um, you know, just getting this PhD in biophysics, I, I love, I'm one of these people who loves to read the International Peer Review Bioscience Journal. So even back in India, I would go to these, these um, institutes, go into libraries, and read, and I noticed like a lot of these articles were being written by this guy called Narendra Singh, and and then I look at where he's working, King George Hospital in Lucknow, um, Uttar Pradesh, which is my work. town, and so then I go there and I, I say, um, um, you know, where's where's Narendra Singh, and they give me his address. He's my neighbor, it turns out. So I go and I see him. We become such incredible friends. He is talking about Dharma Rajas. He saw a half a million um, people in his life. <clears throat> and Dharma Raj means king of your own Dharma, of your own mission in life, you know. And just doing incredible amount of work, good work. And so uh, he did all this research, 270 articles in the, the literature. And, but he was, he, he despised what he called exclusive medicine. He, he was actually a Raj. You know, even though the Raj system was outlawed in 1948, he was a Raj, right. and he took such good care. And, and it was his people that we actually um, drew the Tulsi on. Oh, wow. And um, so, but he, he was you know, for the people big time. So he would never tell some farmer, you need this like yeah. strange... I met him with him in India with oh, you. That's right. In, right at the yeah. Tulsi Festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He was um, what we call inclusive, yeah. inclusive herbs. Like, whatever herbs are right there, take them. Okay, Kukki. But, but Kukki was up in the mountains. Yeah. The, the point is, is he was like, um, very strict with inclusive and never exclusive, except this Kukki. One. Oh, yeah. wow, really? Yeah. Five, 270 articles, peer-reviewed, fire science journal. And he was smart, PhD, MD, Sanskrit scholar, Ayurvedic doc. And he, but he had to have everything be empirical knowledge. So he'd give 5,000 people this or 5,000 people that. And so his knowledge was epic and, and wow. all empirical. And yeah, he was, I can't tell you what he was curing because, um, because we can't do that. Right. But like well, some you can of the, say, we have FDA rules, we can't say, it cures this disease and that disease, that's practicing medicine because we sell that herb. So we have to talk about what the herb does and yeah. how it works. Yeah. So he was some of the, um, like you can, it's an amazing herb. It's, okay, think about this. The way I see things, 
is one of the, the ways that I categorize medicine is masculine medicine and feminine medicine. Right. Masculine medicine, you attack the problem. And in, uh, feminine medicine, you just simply make the terrain unsuitable for the problem. Right. And that's really therapeutic. Right. And typically, like 80, 20. Like, Which is exactly when I read the Vedic science on the bugs, the, the creamy bugs, the microbes that they talked about. That's exactly how they talked about eradicating and taking care of these bugs, is to change the terrain. Something that Western medicine has only begun to understand a little bit now, and that was 3,500 years ago. So Dr. Sharma was all about you know, using herbs to change the terrain. So right. what you're saying is yeah. that the kuti changes the terrain. It does both. That's one of the right, special things. Okay. Yeah. So you could have, um, you could say there's certain things in the liver that you don't want there, like really powerful Things that, could, and it it is one of the few substances in the world that can eradicate that. Right. And you could also have a liver half gone with cirrhosis, and it will not only get rid of the cirrhosis but restore the liver. Right. And so this is one of the cool things about it, that it it has this um, it can it can play both hands. So it can protect the liver from the environment, which is 400 billion pounds of toxic chemicals we dump in the American environment every year. But it's also a powerful liver cleansing herb mm -hmm. to help support the liver do what its job is to detoxify. But it also enhances the function of the herb. Like yeah. it increases the growth of liver's main antioxidant, glutathione, yeah. and other antioxidants. And antioxidants work through the lymphatic system. That's where they live. And the lymphatic system is the study of rasa, which is what lymph means in Hindi and Sanskrit, which is the study of longevity. So when you take care of the two systems that help your body detoxify your lymph and your liver, and you captured the fort. I mean, that's that's the thing. If you can keep those two guys healthy, your digestion will automatically be healthy mm -hmm. because your digestion depends on liver function, bioflow, and mm -hmm. lymphatic drainage because your lymph drains your intestinal tract and your liver controls the whole digestive process. No bile, no poop, no bile, no stomach acid, no stomach acid, no poop, right. you're in big trouble. So, so it's just a phenomenal kind of herb that just it has to be like you know right, right on top of the list of herbs that which is oh, why it was right for years it was almost every ayurvedic person's number one herb because right. it did so much right. right yeah there's that it's also one of the best herbs for the um support the immune function right uh, which it, also moves through the lymphatic system yeah and many mechanisms and it's uh when i read the peer-reviewed bioscience journals and i read these articles about these herbs about maybe even 90%, it's just confirming what we already know. But 10% of the time, they find something new. And so one of the things that they found out about Kuki is, is um, dementia. And, and like, what happens is you have synapses. And the synapses aren't just suspended in space. There's these protein folds that hold them in space. Right. And so a little bit of inflammation and the wrong signal, these protein folds start folding too much. And then they, they squash the synapses and eventually can kill the whole nerves and the whole nerve bundles. And so there's a few herbs that can go in there. And once the whole thing is dead, then you can support the whole neuroplasticity thing. But there's a level where there's herbs that can go in there and unpack Stop the inflammation that's causing the excessive folding, and then unpack the folding. And so you actually get um, some amount of reversing of dementia, and Kuki is one. I wonder if it's a, you know, there's a, I've written a lot about a classification of herbs called BDNFs, which are brain-derived neurotropic factors, which means these herbs that help support the growth of, of brain function and brain cells. We were told years ago, your brain, Drink six pack of beer and you kill brain cells, so don't drink six pack of beer. Um, but it turns out that you can regenerate your brain cells, and there's certain things that will actually do that. And four, three out of the four well known brain derived neurotropic factors are ashwagandha, turmeric, and bacopa. And I'm wondering if oh. Kukchi falls into that category. It's just been in danger, so it hasn't been studied. Right. One, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And then, of course, fish oil is the other yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, definitely, um, it's definitely there. Yeah, and here's a, you know, there's, to, to go after a retrovirus, there is, it's incredibly hard. A retrovirus, that intelligence is so in incredible. You know, it, it cruises through the body, through the, the veins, into the cell, and it can, um, then once it's in the, the cell, it takes its little RNA, copies it, and then 
attaches it to itself, so it has a DNA, goes to the, into the nucleus and into the chromatid, sniffs your DNA, sticks it in there, and then, you know, then the next time the cell um, multiplies, you have a virus vector. Nice. And so there's like these 12 places to stop it. Uh, in the blood, in the, where, is where it attaches to the, um, to the cell wall. There's all these, um, you can keep it from dividing. Once it divides, you can keep it from um, uh, making DNA. There's these 12 ways. They could use like 10 of those 12 documented. Wow. That's, and that's how a confluence of factors is key. When, when, you know, I grew up in northern Michigan, and in the winter times, you know, cars in the ditch. If I find this car in the ditch by myself, but if me and my brothers and my dad find it, you know, four, the five of us, chances are. Okay, right. But, you know, if I'm on a, a bus of wrestlers going to the next town for a meet, and, and 20 wrestlers come out, the car's going to come out. And so the point is, the confluence of factors is key. But not just a confluence of factors, a coherent confluence of factors. And that is obviously what creepy is. Right. Just has all these different ways of Wow. Yeah. There's here's you know, it's an oral tradition, much had to be memorized. And so um, and so they would use um, like exaggeration to and but with, with Kutki, one of the interesting things is Kutki comes from the Sanskrit word katuki, which katu means um, pungent, and ki means like a maker of pungent. But you taste kutki, it's bitter. Right. So to call a bitter herb the pungent one is like a neon sign. It's like a paradox. Yeah. And this is like in the system, they use paradox a lot to, to just attract your attention. So is it the post digestive effect that's pungent? Or? No, the, um, the taste, the rasa is, is um, bitter and pungent. Post digestive is pungent. But, but it's, is that why they call it the pungent one? Well, because the effect is pungent. There's that, but it's cooling. Yeah, unlike other exactly. pungent herbs, right. which would burn you up and heat you up and give you heartburn and make right. you sweat. Exactly. So this herb is cooling, but the same benefits of a pungent herb. Pungent herbs like ginger, scrub, clean, detoxify. But if you take too much of pepper, like pepper, it's going to burn you up. So you are limited to how much you can take, right? But if you have an herb that has a cooling. Um, has a cooling taste, therefore a cooling energy, but a pungent effect, yeah. you can take a lot of it right. and clean house yeah. without causing any irritation, any right. other inflammation. Right. And right. you all know you eat too many hot peppers, you're, you, know, you only eat so many of those, they clean you out mm -hmm. on every level, right? But you can't take that much of it. And that's how it is with herbal medicine too, right. but this is an herb that has, right. a, has that, that you know, contradiction right. that actually turned out to make it really medicinal. Right. And this. You know, imagine somebody's on the fourth story of a burning building, and they need to jump. You know, imagine then you had a sword, and you say, "Okay, I'll cut you." And on the sword? On the sword, right? Right. No. No. Yeah. You want you want a mattress. That would be better. Single molecule medicine is the sword. Right. You're sick. Okay, I'll cut you. To to treat that person with a single molecule is like catching a person from a burning building on the sword. Right. You know, but you want a whole confluence of factors. And right. that's what cookie is. Cookie wow. is that, that mattress that yeah. and then as you said, you can you can apply a greater force more safely right. and, and more aligned with the whole terrain. So what's interesting about this herb then what you're saying is that this herb, like a lot of other herbs, they really need the support of other herbs. Like with turmeric, great herb, phenomenal. You add black pepper, you boost the absorption by two thousand percent. Other herbs like Boswella, you add you know, ginger and ashwagandha and turmeric to it, it boosts its absorption. So, yeah, a lot of herbs we formulate specifically. Mm -hmm. But this herb, the cookie, seems like it really is you know, a one-stop shop. You, we can take it by itself, yeah. and it yeah. really delivers. It yeah. doesn't need help. Right. In fact, um, you know, you're selling this in, in capsules, right? right? What I recommend is you open the capsules, and you put it in hot water, and you take it by the shot. And to, when you take it by the shot, you get this a distinct like this wave over you yeah. and it's you can you can feel that power so you just boil it down and make a real strong 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 tea and then just take it down that way too which is which is great yeah that's great also a great thing about whole herbs but, yeah. yeah so anyway i i want to um thank you so much for being here coming here to talk to us today about this this is a such an important mission i think you know i've been 
gosh, in practice, you know, since 1984, practicing Ayurveda since 1986, um, full time. And I'm more excited about Ayurveda in general today than I was back then, which I was pretty excited back then. But I have to say, I'm more excited about this project than probably anything I've ever done in mm -hmm. Ayurveda before, because it's something that, you know, I've done projects in India where I've given back and went to the same foothills and got herbs from some of the big pharmacies and dispensed them to the local people in the villages. So I've, I, I've seen the need there, and, and I, that was really special for me to go back and give back in that regard. But this is something that is preserving not only the herb, but the oral tradition, the ecology, supporting the farmers like in ways that they've never been supported before, and also providing for us as consumers an herb that is no slouch. This is a the number one, maybe maybe right up there is number one Ayurvedic herb. It's hard to give so many right. really good ones, but but it's right up there in terms of its potent and power. For sure, in the world of the liver, right. it's the number one for sure. Right. So I, I, you know, we have a website uh, at lifespot.com slash rare r a r e. Uh, restoring Ayurveda's rare ecology, uh, where, where the proceeds are going back to Dunagiri and to the farmers. So I, I highly encourage you to support us. Go to the Dunagiri website, see what Prashanti is doing directly. Uh, and that's Dunagiri, D U N I? D U N A. D U N A G I R A. I can't spell. G I R I. G I R I. Spell, spell it again. Dunagiri. D U N A G I R I dot org. Dot org. Right. Could never spell, so I have. Spell check. Um, so, so uh, I, I deeply appreciate you being here and the work you're doing. You, you have no idea. Whenever I call him, you know, I text him. He's like some exotic place in some exotic mountain somewhere in the world. I mean, it's, he's just nonstop going, 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 driven to support this. So, in cooperation with with you, uh, I'm so grateful for the work you're doing. And mm -hmm. I feel like this is a small thing we can do to help help keep this foundation alive mm -hmm. and make this whole right. thing work because right. this, hopefully this is the beginning of many really right. amazing, because remember, the herbs that are endangered are the ones everybody wanted, right? They didn't just get endangered because they were the yeah. lousy ones. The really good ones are the ones that really work amazingly well and have benefits like right. the Kuti. So we're, we're, we're hoping this is just the beginning of a long line of endangered herbs that we can actually take off that list. Definitely, imagine, imagine. Yeah, that, that will yeah. take something off that yeah. list. That would be so great. So we're not going anywhere. We're here for the long haul, and uh, we're going to make this happen. And you know, I said earlier, where sustainability isn't sustainable unless it's market-driven sustainability. And so without you coming in, it, it wasn't. You know, I have a lot of connections with organic in, or via previous work, but like to, like you're so critical and it's so key. Like I said there's a chasm, and without you. It just it doesn't happen and so it's so thankful but you are the truly the last leg of this you you are the ones who have to recognize this market-driven sustainability and to choose to choose what you want like whatever you give your money to that is what survives in the world and and this is where it's at you just you become more aware of, of what's worthy of support and and then you make that choice and you support that and so I so appreciate you also uh, just, just finishing that cycle of market-driven sustainability. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you all for tuning in and listening and Prashanti for your work. Thank you. We'll do this again. We'll have Prashanti back and talk about some of the latest, newest developments that are taking place. We'll keep you posted. Thank you all. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by LifeSpa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at LifeSpa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.